Welcome uh, to tonight's presentation. I'm Dave House, Vice Chairman of the Board of the Computer History Museum, and I want to welcome you to this uh, evening with the legendary Silicon Valley venture capitalist Arthur Rock and uh, in a conversation with John Markoff. First, let me ask, uh, raise your hand if this is your first uh, lecture here at the museum. You've never been to a lecture before. I'm always amazed at how many first-timers we have at each of these events. Welcome tonight. We're happy to have you here. This lecture is the first of three that were made possible by the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation in a recent grant that they gave to the museum uh, documenting the history of semiconductors up to the integrated circuit. This is a $546,000 grant to study, both study and educate people about the history of the integrated circuit. It includes the development of some exhibits, including one for our timeline exhibit that will uh, open up late in 2009. And it'll also help with educational programs that'll improve the science literacy of Bay Area students. This program is all being conducted under the auspices of the Semiconductor Special Interest Group here at the Computer History Museum. That's one of three special interest groups, one featuring or focusing on software, one on uh, rotating magnetic memories, and the third on semiconductors, three key technologies that made computing possible. If you would be interested in working on the semiconductor special interest group, David Laws is a member of the staff here at the museum, and he's the person to contact if you'd like to volunteer, and I'd encourage you to do so, I co-chair that committee. Now, uh, there's a uh, survey that we have tonight uh, that is, I think, on your chairs. And uh, we'd like you to fill out that survey to help us evaluate our, and improve our program. It's part of our continuous improvement program. And as an enticement for you to do that, we're going to offer three copies of this new book. It's a beautiful coffee table book called uh, Core Memory, a Visual Survey of Vintage Computers Featuring Machines from the Computer History Museum. It's done by uh, photographer Mark Richards, and it contains the most phenomenal pictures from our collection. Really interesting book with commentary on each of these various uh, items something that you'll want to have. We're going to give away three copies tonight. We're going to have a drawing. You hand in your survey at the uh, end of tonight's program. You'll be entered into this uh, drawing, and we're going to pick three winners from the survey. People will com uh, uh, complete their surveys, and we will be notifying you by mail if you're one of those three winners. Core Magazine is the museum signature publication for our members. It's in uh, the final stages of completing the next edition. You should expect to be seeing that in the mail in the month of June, so keep your eyes open for that. And uh, one last thing about the Computer Museum is a exciting exhibit that's going to open in September of this year titled The Victorian Computer. Charles Babbage in 1822, first wrote about the design of his difference engine. It was a mechanical calculating machine. This machine was never built in the Victorian era, but in, eight, in 2002, the Science Museum of London complete, completed the first full-size Babbage engine. And interestingly enough, it worked. Now, this uh, set a new Guinness World Record, displacing Microsoft for the longest development ever. <laughs> 180 years from the beginning to the completion. It also set the record for being bug-free, something Microsoft has yet to achieve. <laughs> now, I don't mean to pick on Microsoft. Uh, they do an excellent job and are a good supporter of the, the museum. But I think all of us who've worked in com the computer industry and the information industry understand the complexity of products we design today and the issues uh, with getting it right. And it's amazing that somebody could design this product 
uh, 180 years before it was completed and have it work uh, uh, successfully. Now, the first engine was completed by the Science Museum of London and is there. It was completed in 2002. But over the last three years, a duplicate engine, and only the second one ever made, was constructed, complete with the printing apparatus that Babbage had created. He created this machine because of the many errors that were found in calculations in table form, and he knew one of the primary or one of the important causes of errors was the transcription after the calculation was made to the actual printing. So he produced a device that would actually make the printing plates for these devices and designed that as well, and, and the second machine has that printing device attached. It'll be here for one year on loan, uh, starting this fall in September. It weighs five tons. It's a big piece of machinery. There's 8,000 pieces inside it. You'll be able to see it actually operate and do its calculations. And finally, before we launch tonight's program, I'd like to recognize ID Tech Campus. Uh, ID Tech Campus offers a week-long day and overnight summer programs for students at the ages 7 to 17 in 50 prestigious universities in 22 states and, and in Spain. More students are enrolled in ID Tech Campus than any other summer technology camp. ID Campus is a partner of the Computer History Museum, and they have gracious, uh, graciously donated a full scholarship this year for worth $729 for one child. It's, and we're going to raffle that off at this time. So uh, all attendees who came tonight are eligible. If you filled out the raffle ticket you received when you came in, I've got uh, Karen Thrum Safran here, the VP of Marketing, to say a couple words, and then we're going to raffle off the ticket. All right. Well, again, my name is Karen, and I know you're anxious to hear the speaker, so I'll be very quick. And as um, he described, we run summer technology camps for kids throughout the country. We are the largest technology campus computer camp, so something near and dear to all of your hearts. So kids ages 7 to 17, they program robots, they uh, make digital movies, make video games, make websites with flashy animation. They do all sorts of fun things at prestigious universities like Stanford, Santa Clara, UC Berkeley, all over. So we are going to choose a lucky person. And if you don't have a child, that's OK. You can give it to somebody. And I have a certificate here that's good for a full week. It's, over, it's worth over $729. OK, the winner is, now I, I don't know if I'll pronounce Richard? your name. Richard Shuford. Shuford. Richard Shuford, are you in here? Oh, okay. excellent. So if you will see Karen. And thank you very much, and enjoy the presentation, and thank you for coming to this uh, wonderful event. Get your certificate from Karen. Okay, thank thank you. you. Thank you, Karen. It gives me great pleasure tonight to introduce uh, John Markoff. Uh, John is based in San Francisco and is a West Coast correspondent for New York Times where he covers Silicon Valley computers and information technologies. He started out in 1985 with the San Francisco Examiner uh, covering Silicon Valley and then moved in 1988 uh, to the Times where he's, uh, his works are well known since then. Beside his many works in uh, the uh, New York Times and other important computer publications, he's also an important author, and he has uh, co-authored a number of books, um, including uh, Cyberpunk, Outlaws, and Hackers on the Computer Frontier in 1991. He co-authored The High Cost of High Tech in 1985. Uh, he he, he uh, authored uh, want, uh, the um, uh, takedown, the, the uh, pursuit and capture of America's most wanted computer outlaw, and his most recent publication, uh, What the Dormouse Said, How the 60s Counterculture Shaped the Personal Computer Industry. I have to say that title piques my imagination, and I'm looking forward to that. And I will leave it to John to introduce our guest tonight, uh, Arthur Ryan. Thanks Thank very you. much. Good evening, everyone. <clears throat> this is a real treat for me, because if you grew up in Silicon Valley and you, know, you follow the lore of Silicon Valley, 
Arthur Rock is always part of uh, the, the, the Valley's lore. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to, to, uh, to talking with you tonight. Um, our guest, Arthur Rock, uh, grew up in Rochester, New York, and his family owned a candy store where he worked when he was growing up. I'd like, I hope we can learn more about the candy store as the evening goes on. Um, he was one of America's first venture capitalists, and, um, and as such, he played a seminal role in creating Silicon Valley. Um, he persuaded the so-called traitorous eight to leave Shockley Semiconductor and found Fairchild Semiconductor. Later, he would help create Teledyne, Intel, Apple, Intercel, uh, scientific data systems, among others. Um, I read that between 1961 uh, and 1968, uh, his firm, uh, Davis and Rock, invested $3 million and returned $100 million, which is sort of the, the I guess that's the, what, what we mean by venture capital returns, as, as we would like them to be. Um, I wanted to start this evening um, by asking uh, what brought you to, 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 uh, to Silicon Valley. You, you didn't start here, but you came here very early, and something attracted you. What was it? Well, what attracted me was that first, uh, uh, we, I got this letter from uh, Gene Kleiner uh, when I was in New York, and it was actually written by his wife, suggesting that uh, Eight of the seven of the scientists at Shockley uh, were not happy there, and could I find them a job? And together, so they could work together instead of spreading out. And uh, this piqued my interest, and uh, together with one of the managing partners of Hayden Stone, uh, the firm that I was with on Wall Street. Uh, we came out here and uh, got the idea that uh, perhaps we could form, agree to form a company and, uh, and then see if we could get uh, an, uh, one of the companies that had told us they were uh, looking for scientific, to expand in the scientific area. Uh, to uh, invest a million and a half dollars. And uh, <clears throat> we went to all of these companies, 35 in total, and all of them turned us down uh, because they didn't see how they could culturally uh, invest in a subsidiary and not upset their, um, uh, their employees. So we were about to give up when uh, someone had suggested we see Sherman Fairchild. And we did see him, and he was excited by the idea, and he got one of his companies, Fairchild Cameron Instrument Company, to invest the million and a half dollars. Um, and that's how I started coming out here. So it, at first it was a business deal. There was... Oh, definitely. Yeah, there was no... There was, uh, there was no, uh, the, the, the culture that would attract you later, did, uh, you didn't, I mean, you were on track to become, an, you were an investment banker. I was an investment banker, but I always wanted to do new, new companies, new startups, uh, and I had done several of them uh, while I was at Aiden Stone. Were they technology oriented already? Yes, most of them were. So you were, even though you weren't a technologist by background. I'm not a technologist by background, nor am I a technologist today. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> the interesting thing about that Fairchild Semiconductor deal was that there were seven of them to begin with, but they talked Bob Noyce into joining them. So then they became the treacherous eight. And uh, so we divided up the company um, they each got. Um, I think it was ten percent. Ten percent, which which amounted to eighty percent, and Hayden Stone got twenty, and that's where the famous eighty twenty began with. <laughs> for all you venture capitalists, if there are any in the room, you can thank me for your eighty per, for your twenty percent. <laughs> uh, when Eugene Kleiner wrote you, what was he doing, and how did he find you? His father 
had a customer's man, which were brokers in those days, uh, and uh, he wrote to his father's broker, and uh, they, and he turned it over to me. And the letter came to your desk. Can you, correct. Yeah, interesting. And at that point, um, had you were you exposed to computing? Um, and you had you had invested in a transistor company already, or was I had in, we had invested in a company called General Transistor, um, which uh, made trans uh, germanium transistors, not silicon, uh -huh. and the computer the, those uh, devices were used primarily in hearing aids. I have a hearing aid now. It doesn't have a transistor in it. <laughs> <laughs> but um, at that juncture, you, you still had, uh, you had no sense that there was something special or different about computing than other industries? Uh, no, no. Yeah. It was just, it was a good business deal and... The, well, it, it was, it became obvious to me uh, while we were doing the general transistor deal that these transistors were going to be used in more than uh, hearing aids, and uh, they just starting to be used in computers. And uh, you know, I had no idea, of course, that computers would become as per, per, become uh, 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 as widely used as they are today, and for such scientific purposes. But it was obvious that. There was a future there. Yeah, I'm. I'm also interested in, in what would ultimately cause you to cut the ties with the East Coast. You had you'd gone to Harvard, is that right? You'd come Harvard. through Harvard Business School, so you were you were kind of on that cultural track to to to, to be an investment banker for your career. Well, why would you Why would you give well, that? Well, when I started coming out with uh, Fairchild Semiconductor, I realized that there were a lot of small companies around this area that were looking for capital, and the capital was all in the East, and that I thought that maybe I could bring some of the Eastern capital out to the Wild West. <laughs> and at that point, Wild, I mean, it was no longer, it was, it was, I mean, the electronics industry was on the East Coast. The IBM was there, the, the old mainline electronics firm. Did, did you see something? I mean, when you well, I, I, I saw that the people were much more entrepreneurial here and uh, were willing to take on ch chances that people on the East Coast were not. And does any of that go back to your, your family roots? Do you think you saw something because of what you had, your family life growing up that you might have missed if, if you hadn't been raised the way you were? Well, the entrepreneurial spirit in me was raised by, by my family, but I don't think any of the technical, being interested in, in, in technology yeah. companies were. Yeah. But, um, I mean, you worked in your dad's store? It was I worked in the store. When it, uh, what, what kind of a candy store was it? I mean, what oh, we sold uh, ice cream and uh, candy and... Uh, uh, Did it have a fountain? Was it the classic had a, had a fountain, of... I was a soda jerk. <laughs> so it was Main Street USA, basically. Main Street USA. And your folks had come from Europe? And my, my father had come from Russia, and my mother was second generation, uh, p uh, first born in this country. Uh -huh. And then, um, so you went into the Army, and then did you go directly to, to Harvard after getting out of? No, I went to Syracuse, got an undergraduate. And then as a, a graduate, I see. Yeah. So um, what, what attract, I mean, so you, when you first, did you actually come out and meet the, the eight? Correct. Or seven yeah. and, and, you know, then, the, and then eight? The seven and then the eight. And so what, was something special about Noyce right from the beginning? Was he the... No, there was something special about all of the eight. That they, they were all very, very attractive young people. And deeply unhappy dealing with Bill Shockley. Extremely Shockley. unhappy. Yeah. They, they were going to leave regardless. And I saw that you... And, and if they had left with without forming... Uh, Fairchild Semiconductor, I don't think Silicon Valley would have been what it is because the only place that they really could have gone was uh, either to Texas Instruments or to Philco um, or companies not located here. So there's this serendipity element to the, to the whole thing. I mean, 
one of the things I've always wondered about in the chemistry that created um, Silicon Valley was that Chocolate came here because his mother lived in Palo Alto. And so there's this sort of wonderful... Well, he wanted to get away from everything on the East Coast. He divorced his wife, and he didn't like uh, his fellow Nobel winners, and he just wanted (laughs) wanted out. Did you ever get to meet him? Never met the man. And did he hold you ill will for taking his... No, he did not. As far as I know, he didn't hold me in ill will, but he held all eight of those. Yeah. Um, and so, um, also, I'm very interested in the, the fact that there were 35 companies who were all interested in the technology, but were unwilling to invest. That you you went to, I mean, what was it about the culture at that time that that these, not, nobody would take a risk until you ran into Sherman Fairchild? Well, th- these companies uh, uh, all had order and uh, and form, and uh, none of them were could see how they could set up a separate division and give the people operating that division uh, a larger profit, if you will, than uh, their own employees were getting. They didn't see how that could work. It just wasn't in their mindset. Uh, Options were practically unknown in those days. Yeah. And um, did you... Did you distribute options to the uh, right from the start with uh, with at Fairchild were options user? Did that come come later? They came later, and that was the bone of contention that really caused the eight of them to leave at various times. Because again, uh, Sherman Fairchild had passed away, and the company was based in Syosset, Long Island, and they were a real East Coast company. And they just didn't want to give options to employees. And uh, Noyce and Moore and the others all felt that uh, they had to have options to start competing for employees. And so at that point that they, that they left Fairchild, had you already come west or were you still at any I had come west. The, the, uh, Fairchild Semiconductors formed in 57 and I came west in 61. And to, to set up Davis and Rock. Correct. And, and who was Tommy Davis, and how did you meet him? And Tommy Davis uh, was uh, a vice president of Kern County Land Company in uh, charge of their diversification program. Kern County Land got, had royalties uh, from land they owned in Bakersfield, uh, oil properties. And... Uh, uh, the first company he had formed was Watkins Johnson, and uh, that was the Silicon Valley company right from the start. Right from the start, yeah. or before Silicon Valley, but it was an electronics company. Right, and uh, they made uh, they made lasers and way of traveling wave tubes, that sort of thing, and um, it was going along fairly well. And the way I had met him is that they wanted to take. Uh, uh, the company public and uh, uh, Hayden Stone, I think, did, as I recall, Hayden Stone did that. I'm not sure. But in any event, Tommy then wanted to go on and do other uh, type deals like that. And they said, no, 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 no. Wait a minute. We well, want to wait and see how successful this company is. And Tommy got unhappy with that decision. And he and I then decided to form a venture capital firm. And how did you find your, your investors? They were, most of them were from the East Coast, people I had known. So, and it was and, a personal thing. It wasn't yeah. institutional at that point. It, you could not, institutions could not invest in venture capital firms in those days. It wasn't until the ERISA laws were changed in 1972. So that, that regulatory change, which brought in these huge pools of, of capital, came actually a decade after you had started. Absolutely. Venture capital then was well established as, a, as an enterprise by the time that sort of accelerated. Well, there weren't too many other firms until uh, that was done, until 72. Uh, we started with uh, $5 million. I mean, that's hardly an investment in one company today. 
And that would come from a pool of how, about how many investors? Would that oh, be? I think we had about 15 or 20 investors. And, and did you guys go back east? And, and I, mean, what did, I mean, what did you take with you in order to, to persuade them? It was a totally new idea at that time. Well, they, they, they knew me. These investors had known what I'd done at Aiden Stone. And, and was Fairchild a, 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 a success by that time? So you had yes, that on yeah, your... Yes, yeah, right. And uh, so in your equation, where did Stanford fit? I mean, had, had, was Stanford... You know, there's this model now, but that, did that model... Uh, I mean, did you know of Terman that early, and were there graduate students around, and were they entrepreneurial? Did you see any of that at that juncture? Yeah, I saw all of that. Uh, uh, this is controversial, but in my opinion, uh, there would really not be much of Silicon Valley if it hadn't been for Fred Terman and Stanford, because Stanford did two things. They allowed their professors to work part-time, and this was unknown in the East. MIT and uh, Princeton and, and other schools would not let their professors work part-time, start companies. And also, they had all this land, and uh, they allowed uh, these companies to uh, rent uh, or, or lease space from them. Yeah. And it, it, the way I understand it, Terman actually set out to do that intentionally because he didn't want his students to have to go back east. That, to that's work right. Them. That's right. And so, I mean, uh, could uh, could you walk the halls and look for students with ideas, or did they did they come to you? Well, we were the only that? game in town, so they all came. They all came to us. <laughs> We, we didn't have to go looking. And, and at that point, was Terman Dean, or was he still? Uh, well, when I got to know him, he was Dean. I, I'm not sure what he was in the beginning. And uh, I think his, his protege was a man by the name of John Linville. Was he, do you remember Linville? No, no, I don't remember him. Okay, so it, it was Terman, though, who was the? the he, uh, he was the, the lead. Yeah. Um, I saw in one of your interviews uh, mentioned the fact that one of the things you did early on uh, was selling magazines door to door. Was, was that your first job, or was that a job along the... Well, I was pretty young when I did that, so it must have been my first job. Was, yeah. it, was it hard work? Not especially. I, I enjoyed uh, the commercial uh, life. Yeah. And were you successful? Yeah. You, yeah. Right. I, well, I sold a few magazines anyway. <laughs> Saturday Evening Post and Liberty. <laughs> that was the big seller? That's good. <laughs> Um, so one of the things that I saw you mentioned that, that I, I was intrigued with, just because I always thought that the um, integrated circuit um, came into being in part because of, the, of the, the need to squeeze more circuitry into the nose cone of a ballistic missile. And I saw you talked about the heat issue in one of your interviews, that, that uh, germanium was problematic, and one of the the uh, attractions of silicon was that it, it had a wider temperature range. Correct. So it wasn't so much the scaling of the circuitry initially, but other No, properties? I don't think so, although, you know, my memory's a little fuzzy there. But as I recall, uh, the first big business deal that uh, uh, Fairchild Semiconductor did was with the uh, Space Bureau. Um, they won a contract to... Uh, and that was a tough business because they um, had to qualify so many of these circuits and a lot of them didn't work. It didn't hold up under a heat uh, test. And it was a new technology, right? A they new were technology. displacing trans transistors. Exactly. And at, th at that juncture with Fairchild, right at the start, how hands-on, you were a director, I take it. Right? Not a Fairchild. Not, oh, not a Fairchild, okay. So you were not hands-on in, in that? I was period. not hands-on to Fairchild. Um, different at Intel. You, you Intel, I was hands-on. Attended the staff meetings and uh, was a director for 30-some-odd years. And, and so um, do you remember the, the um, in 1965 when Gordon Moore sort of observed this doubling of, of density? Was it a big deal at the time? No, no. Didn't think anything about I it? I didn't think anything about it. And I think Gordon is now going to be known more for his law than for starting Intel. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, but at, at that point, um, did you, I mean, was, was, was sort of scaling something you intuitively understood, or did, I mean, was it not part of the sort of common parlance before Gordon sort of 
evoked that with his, his article. Well, I think Gordon just observed this and, uh, and, you know, said this is the way it has been probably, and this is the way it probably will be. And I don't think it was any more than that at first. But now it's, it's, it's so much of the culture of the valley, I mean, particularly in terms of, in, uh, of industries where the, you know, the children eat their parents and opportunities that come at regular intervals. And you, you didn't see any of that in the... No, no. Um, t tell us a little bit about scientific data s systems and Max Pilevsky. Max Pilevsky. Um. Max had started developing computers uh, when he was with uh, Packard Bell Electronics, and Packard Bell was a poorly managed company and ran into troubles and, uh, and refused uh, after a while to fund uh, uh, the computer division. And Max quit, and uh, through uh, a so-called finder uh, came across me and uh, we decided to, uh, to back him. Um, Max was, it, it was and is a very interesting man. Uh, his style of leadership, uh, which worked very well while, uh, while he was running the company, he was a very, very good manager. Uh, but his style was different than most people's style. Uh, his was an easy going, slap you on the back, put his feet up on the table. I think he was the first executive I ever came across who didn't wear a tie. Um, and that's the kind of a guy he was. And, uh, and uh, we, uh, he finally decided that what he wanted to do was really not be in the computer business, but make enough money so that he could be with the beautiful people. And that's what he's done. And that's what he's done. And at that point, was the, the target market was scientific computers, but scientific computers. But was it also IBM? Was it? No, we were. Were you trying to avoid IBM? Or? We 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 were trying to avoid IBM, and we had a, a rule, uh, more or less, for the marketing department, that unless our computer could give four times as much value as an IBM computer, we wouldn't even go after the customer. Because it was IBM, you couldn't make a mistake with IBM. But was there enough headroom that you could do that frequently? Yeah, we did it. We did it very, very well. And, and I think I saw that you said that SDS was one of the first companies that actually gave stock options to, to all employees? No, that no. was Intel. Oh, that was Intel. I see. Okay. We did give options at SDS, but uh, primarily only to the executive staff. And were you involved in the decision to sell to the Xerox? And Very much, because uh, as I said, Max want, didn't want to do this full time. And uh, we, had a, we got an offer that we really couldn't refuse. And it's pretty interesting. The reason that Xerox wanted to buy, we found this out a year later, or six months later. The reason. Xerox wanted to buy SDS was because IBM was going into the copying business. Right. And Xerox felt that they had, to, in or, they had to be in the computing business. So a few months after they bought us, the company was going, they changed the name to XDS, which was fine. And uh, a couple of months later, they came to us and said, hey, look, you guys are making scientific computers. That isn't why we bought you. We want you to start making business computers. And then they put in a few of their own executives uh, at XDS. And within 18 months, the company folded up. And it didn't have to be that way. I it don't think so. classic business. Framework. I don't think so. I think it was a, one of the classic cases of mismanagement I've ever heard of. Yeah. <laughs> There are others, but. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, so when, 
when Noyce and, and, and Moore came back to you to do Intel, did you guys already have a, a sort of deep relationship? Was it sort of a... Oh, a, yes, a slam, yes. Yeah. Slam oh, no, we, we, especially with Noyce, Moore, Moore, Moore uh, was, was and is kind of an aloof person. Uh, he's a wonderful man, but he's uh, not... But Noyce and I had a great relationship. I think I read that you wrote the business plan for Intel? Two and a half pages, double-spaced. <laughs> <laughs> is, is there a lesson there that still holds today? Well, the lesson is that once you get the lawyers involved in, in, in writing these plans and making sure that you can't be sued for anything, the plans get up to two and three inches thick. Yeah. Do you remember anything? It was it was a plan to describing um, solid state memories. Is is that? No, it was a plan devised to say nothing. <laughs> I see. I see. <laughs> and you were you were able to raise how much money with that initially? Uh, two and a half million dollars. Yeah, that's right. And then. You, you took a seat on the board, and you were actually st you stayed on the board for, for many, many 33 years. 33 years, yeah. Till, until uh, there was an automatic retirement age. But that was not your only, um, uh, you started Intersil as, as well? Intersil was Jean Horny. He was one of the Fairchild Treacherous oh, that's right. Eight. Yeah, that's right. And it, initially, did, you were able to start, it didn't compete with Intel at that No, point. it did not compete. They were making field effect transistors and entirely different and where they started when they started to compete they started to compete in the watch business of all things right. Right. and both of them went out of the watch business eventually but as soon as that competition started I uh, got off the inner sill board that was, was, was that the first for the semiconductor guys was that the first consumer market um, for, for that industry? Do you remember if there were other ventures before? There may have been, but I, I don't, I, I think that was probably the first. And it was, it was a terrible, uh, was there ever a success or did it, it was just a... It was, how are you going to compete with Psycho and, uh, and yeah. the, and the, uh, uh, and the Japanese and the, and the Swiss? I mean, you can't compete with them in the watch business. Um, so, did you um, invest in Teledyne after you were in the Valley, or did that come before? The, um, I raised the initial money for Teledyne a few months before I moved to California. And then when Davis and Rock was formed, we, in, we made a follow-on investment. In fact, I knew I was going to do that when I set the thing up. And, and I was on their board for 34 years. And the idea was about conglomerates, right, conglomerating right from the start? Right from the start, in, in primarily in, uh, in the technology field. At least we started off in the technology field. That, that idea is, I mean, I'm trying to think, it, that idea has sort of disappeared from the scene at the end of the 60s, 70s? Did it sort of fall out of fashion or? Well, that's essentially what General Electric is. Um, so tell me about meeting Steve Jobs for the first time. Well, and my friend Mike Markle here is responsible is for, all, for all of this. <laughs> <laughs> um, Mike asked me if uh, I'd be interested in uh, investing in, um, in Apple Computer. Mike uh, had backed them originally, you know, I think it was a $300,000 loan, $350,000, something like that. He, he backed a, uh, he's uh, guaranteed a bank loan. And he asked me, I had known Mike at, at um, Intel. And um, pardon me, oh, okay. um, and um, so he sent Steve and the two Steves up to see me and boy, I, I was really unimpressed. <laughs> uh, n not by their knowledge or by their entrepreneurial spirit, but uh, these guys just, uh, you know, they, they didn't appear to be, uh, they didn't have the appearance that one would expect from someone looking for, for cash. <laughs> um, 
and I kind of hem and hawed with Mike, and Mike said, well, what you really ought to do is go down to the uh, computer show in San Jose. I think it was called the Homebrew Computer Show. It may have been something else, but in any event, I went down to San Jose, and uh, in this big auditorium, all these companies were there uh, showing off their, uh, their gear, and no one was at these other companies. They, the, the people around the Apple booth were, it was everybody at the show. <laughs> and I could not even get close to see the, 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 and at that point, I knew, well, maybe we had something. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, that's when I got interested. And, uh, and this was the Apple One at this point. This was Apple One. The, this was before plastic, I think. It was the Apple, there was no plastic case for the Apple One, is that right? Okay, <laughs> the expertise. But, um, and do you remember, there was a, a point where Steve Wozniak went to HP and asked them if they were interested in entering the personal computer market, and they turned him down. Did that happen before? I think that happened yeah, before, but it yes, right. must have been. Yeah. Um, now, at, at that point, did, did you ever work on Sand Hill Road, or did you no. always work in San Francisco? always worked in San Francisco. Where, where did, how did Sand Hill Road come into being and did you watch it? Or did, did, well, it everything separate? happened after 72. I see. So much later. Um, you know, these f venture capital firms were set up and they, then they had to compete for business to, to get companies to invest in. And uh, so they had to be close to the companies. And, uh, and would you, were you fairly standoffish or did you right from the start do uh, I was I was very standoffish. And uh, I did not see the potential that was there with all this new money that came in from institutional in type investors. Um, I, I was always interested in helping the companies, not in building my own venture capital firm. So I didn't do that. Before, before leaving Intel, there was one thing I wanted to ask you about because uh, Intel made this tremendous gamble at one juncture, relatively early on, when it left the memory business and it and it became a microprocessor company. Um, what did it look like inside, as as someone who was involved in that decision? Well, I think that was, I had nothing to do with that decision, other than as a board member to approve it. Uh, the decision was made by uh, Grove and and Moore. Um, and the famous story, of course, is Grove went in to see Moore and said, what, 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 what would, it, if they brought in new management, if they fired us and brought in new management, what's the first thing they do? And Moore said, they'd get rid of the, uh, the, 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 the memory business. Uh, so Moore, Grove said, of course, you know, let's do that. First. And I had not, nothing to do with that decision. But it was probably the best decision any company's ever made. It probably, and took more guts. Yeah. I mean, to lay off a 30-year workforce and take the big losses they took, uh, uh, just took a lot of guts. And, and you, um, you stayed with Intel. Did you ultimately leave Apple's board because there was competition between Intel and Apple and processors? Was that Well, the, the way that arose is, <clears throat> Um, Apple um, had a design team to design circuits, and I didn't see where there was any conflict in that. And either they hid it from me or I wasn't astute enough to catch on, but what they did is they had this design team with Motorola and uh, IBM. and. Um, Then this, there's this announcement in the Wall Street Journal, New York Times, Mercury News, Chronicle, all these papers, double page, uh, announcing that they were going to build a power chip and they would, quote, it was what it said, we will kill Intel. And, you know, uh, I just had to get off the yeah. uh, Apple board. Yeah. <laughs> During that period, I, I wanted to ask your philosophy. Uh, how did you pick the entrepreneurs that you decided to back? Did you have rules of thumb, or was it, was it about the people? Was it about the ideas? 
Well, it's all about the people. Uh, uh, I'm not enough of a technologist to be able to understand what most of these entrepreneurs are uh, about uh, technically. Uh, and the way I went about it was to spend a lot of time with uh, these would-be entrepreneurs. Uh, uh, you know, when you meet with them at first, everything is, is fine. Uh, they're going to tell you what you want to hear. And uh, so I used to meet with these. I had the luxury of not having any competition. So I could meet with these people over a long period of time and try and figure out whether uh, what they were, whether they said the same story twice and three times or whether they changed the story each time and uh, whether uh, they had, you know, the so-called fire in their belly and uh, intelligence. And, uh, and the main thing, of course, is are they honest? And by honest, I don't mean taking money out of your pocket, but intellectually honest. And uh, do they see things the way they are and not the way they want them to be? So I, I saw that in, in one interview you, you sort of made this distinction between this period, the dot-com period, where there rose this class of promoters as entrepreneurs as opposed to company builders. And is company building still around? Do you think you can find that as opposed I, to... I think it's starting again. I, I, uh, but, uh, you know, in the period around 2000, uh, there were an awful lot of promoters. Um, I remember uh, one investment banker who I know quite well uh, told me that he'd get venture capitalists calling him and asking, what's trading hot in the market? I want to start a company around that. And, uh, you know, that's not the way to build a business. Did, did you leave the field? Were, were you still actively investing in that period, sort of 95 to 2000, or did you sort of leave the I, field? I kind of left. I kind of got out of the... I, I, I kept on with my investments, and I made small investments, but uh, the, the idea of starting a company and competition and going out and and, um, you know, knocking on doors just didn't appeal to me. Yeah. Um, I wanted to, uh, we're going to open it up soon. I, I, I know you s said you wanted to hear from the audience, but I, I did want to ask about your philanthropic activities now. You've, you've got a, a, a sort of spread of, of interests from corporate governance to, to children's education. Sort of what motivated those interests and what are you doing? Well, what I'm mostly interested in is uh, children's education, K through 8. Uh, my theory is that uh, uh, if this country is going to compete with uh, what's going on in the rest of the world, uh, we need to have educated people. And uh, in the inner cities, uh, less than half of the kids, uh, in the big cities, the big inner cities, less than half of the kids uh, graduate from high school. And that was okay many, many years ago when these people could, you know, go into steel mills and automobile factories and use their brawn. But uh, today, this is all done by computers. And unless you have a, 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 at least a high school education, uh, you're not going to find a job. And uh, I think it's just going to be a terrible thing for, uh, for this country. And our education system stinks. Um, and uh, you do that by finding programs that are promising and how, how do you uh, well, make a difference well I've got a, a few programs uh, the basic fund Bay Area scholarships for inner city kids <clears throat> at the moment we're giving scholarships to 4,500 kids in the Bay Area to attend private schools 420 schools I think and then I'm uh, interested in uh, Teach for America and I guess everybody here must know about that program. And, uh, and also, I'm uh, getting interested in KIPP. Um, and I'm trying to spend most of my time and give uh, m uh, monies to those kind of endeavors. You've also focused on corporate governance. And I, I, you know, you've, you've helped create centers both at Harvard and Stanford that I, that I know of. Is that correct? Well, no. Um, Harvard is, uh, is not corporate governance. It's entrepreneurial uh, activities uh, to encourage uh, them to teach uh, entrepreneurial uh, 
and they're doing a great job there. They have a building and uh, and are developing courses, and uh, as far as I can tell, they're doing are doing well. Um, the Stanford, uh, I, I know knew, know Joe Grunfels quite well, and he's interested in corporate governance, and um, it seemed to me as though all of the corporate governance activities were uh, in the East Coast again, and uh, and there were n nothing here on the West Coast devoted strictly to corporate governance, and uh, there were a lot of problems uh, here, as we found out, and uh, so I, I helped set up a, a center for corporate governance. You know, in the, in or Tony and I did. Yeah. Did did you um, did you uh, uh, I, you're referring to your wife, I think. Is that right? correct? Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, uh, did you come up, up, away with strong feelings one way or another on the impact of Sarbanes-Oxley and its efforts to, to sort of right some of the, the wrongs of the... Yeah, I, I, I think that the Sarbanes-Oxley law ought to be repealed. Uh, I think it's a detriment to our uh, corporate activities. The only good part of Sarbanes-Oxley, in my opinion, uh, and I, I get some feedback from other people on this, uh, is uh, that the CEO has to sign off on the financial statements. Yes. Other than that, I think it's a real waste of time and effort, especially for small companies. Let's, let's open it up to the audience. Uh, we, we wanted to ask people to go to the two microphones on either side of the room and please uh, introduce yourself, but um, have at it. Why don't we start on this side first? Uh, this is K.R.S. Murthy. Um, now that China, India, and other countries have emerged as entrepreneurial countries um, with not only service oriented but also manufacturing, uh, product development, etc. in the new technologies as well like nanotechnology. What is your vision of how the venture capital side of it? I'm sorry. I was I, on the venture capital side of it, how would it be different than in other countries compared to what was done here by us in Sand Hill Road and, and uh, pioneers like you in uh, you know, in the earlier times, in the venture or private place memorandum kind of a thing that we did. What's your vision so, for the international? So the, the role of venture capital outside of this country? Yeah, how will it be different? You know, I mean, they, do they take the same templates and have a cookie cutter approach? I don't think it's different at all. I think it's the same players doing the same things. Okay. Um, let's go back and forth. So. Uh, hi, I'm Rohit Kari, a student and entrepreneur. but. I was just curious, given the long perspective you have on working in the, the Valley and in, in business in general, about the pace of business and how much has it changed from the era of, um, you know, long distance telephone call as a major form of communication to email and the expectations that you might be expected to work with a very large number of other people. Uh, and, the, and in particular, I was wondering if you had some vignettes to share about internationalization and how it affected the Valley the first time you might have had a foreign trip to visit a plant for Intel or when the international business and uh, travel really started making a difference to life here for small growing companies. Well, I'll tell you, one thing about uh, foreign companies is that I think Tom Friedman is wrong that the world is flat. I think the world is tipped. And the world is tipped towards India and China, and that's where the more entrepreneurial activity is going to take place and uh, as I said, unless we educate our people, uh, we're going to lose out to them. Um, and I'm sorry, was there any oh, other? I asked a question about the pace of business and how it's changed, the rapidity of. The amount of travel required, you know, that sort of thing. A lot of travel is required. People are going, I, I, I don't really don't get the essence of your question. Well, I was curious. For example, in the history of Intel, at some point they started investing significantly overseas and building new plants and so on. We <coughs> might have imagined they'd have board meetings abroad or at least tours of the factories. I mean, just curious if there are milestones you can think of when you said, boy, we're making a huge percent of our revenue overseas or any milestones of that nature. 
this one, was there a point at which Intel became a global company that you really, it really struck you that uh, the world was different? Well, we st I think Intel started, uh, I think, uh, over 50% of our volume came, uh, oh, probably about 10 or 15 years ago from overseas. And um, started off primarily with uh, uh, Japanese uh, customers, and um, gradually, I think now India and China are Intel's biggest customers. And uh, we have plants, uh, putting up plants all over the world. I, I think in 1997 or so, Andy Grove co coined this term internet time, just to try to, to deal with the acceleration oh, yeah. of oh, everything. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, did, did you ever get the sense that you know, there was this rapid acceleration in business? And that oh yeah, that, uh, that was very clear. And, uh, as, as a matter of fact, I just uh, uh, invested in a uh, venture capital firm that uh, is called Asia Alternatives. Um, Michael. Hi, I'm Michael Reardon. I'm on the Semiconductor Special Interest Group here at the museum. And I've written Crystal Fire, The History of the Transistor. And I'd like to take you back to the 1950s. I've written about Shockley Semiconductor. Could you Semi hold the microphone a little closer? Oh, I've written so. about Shockley Semiconductor and the origins of Fairchild. In your memory, were there any other instances before that where a group of engineers, scientists from within a company decided to leave, get what we now call venture capital, and start a new company? Or was this a first? Were there anything like it? Anything comparable? I, 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 I'm sorry, I oh, have trouble yeah, hearing. Sure. Uh, he was wondering if um, the departure of the eight from, um, from Shockley was the first instance of that kind of uh, event, of eight employees leaving and looking for outside investment. Um, did, did anything it, it crossed your desk like that before? No, no. This was no. sociologically and culturally a first. I believe so, but yeah. uh, you know, there People and I, are leave, leaving all the time. Yeah. And, uh, and, I, and I think it's important, from my own perspective, that it was enormously successful. Well, it certainly was the first successful one. I don't yeah. know whether there are others that weren't successful that we never heard of. Okay. okay. Brad. I have a question for the audience. Um, I was brought to Silicon Valley as uh, the first employee of a company called Personal Software, and you may remember Venrock uh, was one of the people to fund that company. It didn't come on the best of times in its later life, so we can't have everything. But I wondered how many other people in this room also got their start in Silicon Valley in part due to the contributions of our guest. Uh, oh, well, it's not as many as I hoped. I thought that would be a charge for you. It <laughs> would be a bigger number. Um, but anyway, so thanks. Thank you. Lee Felsenstein. Uh, yes, yeah, yeah, that's my name, Lee Felsenstein. First of all, I just wanted to inject uh, some information. The uh, computer show in San Jose took place in 1978. It was not the homebrew club. That was different, but uh, definitely was this Apple II with its plastic case was there. Because I think that's the only time they had that, the computer fair in San Jose. And it was quite a show. Second, West Coast Computer Fair, the second one. Now the question is that uh, regarding your involvement with educational uh, development. Uh, do you find that there are people coming to you with uh, technological fixes uh, for education? And if so, how do you deal with them? How do you, how do, or in a more general sense, how do you think about that whole well, I don't area? Think, I don't think uh, technology is going to have anything to do with the way of uh, getting these kids uh, educated. I think it's going to take hard work on the part of teachers. You're, you're skeptical about a project like projects like Mick Negroponte's project, where he plans to give a hundred dollar laptop to every kid in a country. I, I'm not. Yeah, th th that's fine, but it's going to take a teacher to teach the kids. Yeah. Right. Okay. So. My name is Mike Pelzel. Uh, my position is unemployed right now, so I just graduated from college. But um, I was wondering, in your experience, you've seen both success and failure, and I was wondering what the key metrics to success are, in your opinion, whether it's a person or an enterprise or anything. Management. 
being able to recognize, you know, their mistakes and go on to uh, do other things and uh, get around their problems. Um, you know, there are all kinds of good ideas around, but they're very, you know, I, I once wrote an article called uh, um, um, t- uh, Tactics Versus uh, uh, Ideas. Uh, what was the name? Uh, I'll, f- I'll find it. I've got it here. Uh, <laughs> strategy versus strategy tactics. Strategy versus tactics. From the strategy win- wins every time. Uh, tactics win never. Uh, <laughs> tactics win every time. It's a way to do things that uh, that make the difference between success and failure. It's not the ideas. The ideas are a dime a dozen. And so then, are there are there naturals or are these things learned? They're not naturals, but they're people who can develop these skills and. You know, that's part of what we're trying to do at Harvard is develop these skills and would-be entrepreneurs, make it easier for them. But uh, uh, it's really uh, people. Okay, Mike Ritter. Um, I'd be interested in hearing what your worst investment was and how you could have not made it, what you would have had to know to not make it. <laughs> no, you don't have to answer. No, no, I don't know what the question is. Oh, I'm oh. sorry. Um, he, he wanted to. He asked what your your worst uh, investment was and oh, how I, you might have avoided it. That, that oh, thing. easy. Uh, Diasonics. <laughs> Medical instruments company. Is that yeah, correct? Yeah, yeah. Um, we were the first company to make uh, an ultrasound machine for medical purposes other than what Hewlett Packard was doing in one small area of medicine. We were the first company to build an MRI machine and we blew it. And the way we blew it was twofold. One is, one was a strictly business question. Um, The the MRI machine sold for a million and a half dollars and we didn't understand that GE and Siemens would build the same machine, go to the hospital, and say, tell the hospital, try the machine for a year. Don't pay us. See if it works. And a small company just can't compete against that. We, we needed to make the sale and get paid. So that was a business thing. The other thing is we had a CEO who was absolutely... Uh, had to tell the world how great the company was and what the earnings would be. And when he couldn't make them, he uh, did some things which uh, uh, weren't weren't so nice. And I was not astute enough to uh, to find him. Uh, my name's Brian Dipert from EDN Magazine. Uh, from what you've said this evening, I sense that you had a very strong loyalty to Intel uh, over the years. When there was a, a business conflict between Intercell and Intel, you left the Intercell board. When there was a business conflict between Intel and Apple, you left the Apple board. And I'm curious, and there may have been others as well, I'm curious why the strong loyalty to Intel? Was it specifically the relationship you developed with Bob Noyce? What other factors were there? Well, I'd been on the Intel board longer than any of those other companies. So I had a loyalty based on on time. And uh, I sure liked the people at Apple, and I liked the people at Intercel. Uh, but they had entered Intel's business. It, if Intel had entered their business, it may have been a different uh, situation. When they entered Intel's business, I felt my loyalties had to be to Intel. Thank you. Hi, my name is Paul Cubbage. I'm a software guy. I founded a few software companies, including the Wollongong Group and Open Country. In 1969, I had a one-man company called Blue Sky Enterprises. I always tell people the worst job I ever had is when I worked for myself. But 
On education, the Economist reports that in Europe, they looked at all the various countries to see which had the best educational system. And the best one turned out to be Finland. And seeing some of the successes that have come out of there, it's very interesting. So they asked the Finns, being the Economist, how did you do that? And they said, we fired the administrators and put the teachers in charge. Absolutely. I was going to ask your opinion of that. Absolutely. Rod Page, a former Secretary of Education, said, and I have no qualms whatsoever about quoting him, that the teachers union is a terrorist organization. Yes. Thanks. Mark Taylor. And I have a question about the retrospective of your career. And when you look back, how much do you feel was skill and hard work and how much of it was luck? And if there was one piece of advice you could give yourself before you started the venture of capitalism, what would that be? Well, luck is a funny thing. It's luck all around. Everybody has luck at one time or another. Sometimes it comes earlier, which was my case. But it's taking advantage of the luck and the opportunities. It's not the luck itself. I mean, you almost get killed by a car walking across the street. You say, geez, I was lucky I missed that. But, you know, to take advantage of the luck is something else. And that's what good entrepreneurs do. And what piece of advice would you give yourself? Be lucky. One final question. I got the sense from something you said that you're somewhat optimistic about this period for the Valley. The things you see seem to be positive that are happening generally in terms of the startup culture focused in this region. Oh, I think so. I think so. I think it's coming back. And I think there are bright people around. And there's plenty of money around. And, you know, there hasn't been a 25-year period in American history that hasn't been better than the previous 25 years. So whatever we see as problems today, somehow or other, 25 years, they'll all work out. That would be great. Well, for the audience, I'd really like to thank you for being lucky for the Valley and for our economy and this culture. Thank you, John. And thank you, Arthur. I want to just remind you to fill out your questionnaire so we can have our continuous improvement program going. And I want to make you aware of a very special event coming up October 5th and 6th of this year. We're celebrating Fairchild at 50. And the afternoon of the 5th, we have a number of talks that will be going on and then a guest appearance by Floyd Kwame that evening. And then on the 6th, we're having a nice big reunion party here. So go to put Computer Museum in your browser search engine and click on Computer History Museum, which will come up first. And you'll be able to read more about that. So we invite you to all come. And I have just a small memento here thanking you for the nice appearance. Oh, thank you. I got it backwards. I got Arthur here and John over there. OK. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very nice. Thank you. I really enjoyed it.